All right, welcome my friends. I see us all kind of filing in right now. Um, come on in, get virtually comfortable. <laughs> um, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat box. Um, if you want to say uh, your name and um, your age and where you're watching from, you're welcome to do so. We'd love to be able to say hi to you. I'm going to go ahead and put my name in the chat box. There we go. So uh, feel free to introduce yourself so that we can say hi. Um, then we we'll, we will, uh, as we're kind of giving people a moment to file in, we'll kind of talk about um, our behavior code, then we'll get right into the lab. Just going to give everybody another moment or so. Hi there, Strider. Hi there, Will and Miriam. I'm excited too. Hi, Ruby and Dot. And hi, Michelle and Raina. Really glad to have you guys here. This is going to be really fun. This is this is one of my favorites. I feel like I probably say that for all of them, but it really is one of my favorites. Hi there, Lucas. Hey, Abby. All right. Hi there, Maya. We are really glad to have you guys here. Um, let's go ahead and we'll just we'll just kind of get started here. Um, as always, our, our learning process uh, here is all about respect, respect for ourselves, for each other, and for our world. Um, and we ask all of you to show respect uh, as well by using kind language and appropriate words in the chat box, um, as this is a program for everyone. My friend Max is moderating the chat and can disable the chat function for individual users uh, if that's needed. Um, I don't think it will be needed, but uh, all of that said, it is okay to disagree and share your feelings. We welcome all ideas that are founded in respect and invite everyone to do the same in this online space. So um, hi there, my name is Peregrine, like the Falcon, and uh, this is today's Lab at Home Live with the Museum of Life and Science. Um, when we have the lab on site at the museum, um, we encourage our learners to lead with their questions and ideas, but it's a little bit harder to do in this virtual space. Um, I'm still gonna ask you all plenty of questions, and I hope you will share your ideas uh, and your own questions as much as possible uh, in the chat box. All right. Oh, and, and we had some other people filing in. Hi there, Matthew and Paige. Hi there, Lily and Mia. Hi there, Julian and Daniel. And hi there, Manny. So what I'm going to do is I've got all of, I've kind of got all of my supplies here, and I know that some of you will be doing the lab along with us uh, at home. Hi there, Annika. So um, would you guys let me know if you are doing the experiment along with me? I would just love to know. It's okay if you're not, or it's okay if you're going to try it after uh, or later, but I would love to know if anybody is doing it along. Oh, that's great. We have at least, we kind of have at least two people, three people, more. Oh, that's great. That is so much fun. All right. So we'll tell you a little bit about the materials that we need, kind of the topic that we're going to be uh, talking about. Let's start, let's start there. Um, are the, topic of today's lab is um, plastic. Specifically, we're going to be talking about bioplastic, but we'll back up a little bit to talk about what exactly plastic is first. So I bet you guys have already used plastic today. I know that I have. Um, can you go ahead and tell me what do we think plastic is? Or just an example of something plastic? What do you think? I've got a few examples right here, but I'm going to give you guys just a minute. So what do we think plastic is? What does it make us think of? Do we know what it's made of? Very nice. We're thinking a plastic bottle, a milk bottle, certain kinds of toys, yep, plastic bags. I have a plastic bag right here. This is just kind of a, a clear zipper bag. It's very flexible, it's uh, see-through, it's waterproof. Uh, what else do I have? I have just kind of, this is an old like uh, lotion bottle that I have. I've got a cup. I have got, um, this is my yogurt cup that I used this morning. It had yogurt in it, now it no longer has yogurt in it. So um, all of those things are made of plastic, right? That and much, much more. Um, and uh, it's all, while it's all made out of plastic, it's made out of different kinds of plastic, right? Or, or uh, plastic that's made out of similar things but processed in different ways. Um, because all of these have pretty different properties. That's one of the things about plastic, right? Is it can be very rigid, it can be used many times, um, it can be very flexible and maybe only used a few times, um, or of course there are plastics that are single use, right? Um, so 
how can we find what type of plastic something is? Do you know? There's, there's some certain materials um, that list what type of plastic they are. Do you guys know where to find that information? Yeah, look at the recycling code, exactly. So if I look at the bottom of uh, this lotion bottle, it's a, it's a number two. And that's actually interesting because this is uh, also, the Ziploc is a number two plastic. So these are really, really different products, um, but they're both made of essentially the same type of plastic. I think that's really interesting. So we know that there are uh, different, I'm going to move that out of the way a little bit. We know that there are different types of plastic, but, and sometimes that it's made of slightly different things um, or just processed in different ways. Do we know in general what typical plastics are made of? What do you think? What is your, your typical plastic made out of, like this one? Do we think it's a plant? Do we think it's a mineral? What do you think? Yeah, yeah, exactly. So uh, typical plastics come from, uh, from oil, from petroleum oil. So they are petroleum derived plastics, used to be dinosaurs, <laughs> thank you, Max. Um, so uh, all of these different materials, so, so many materials in our lives are made out of this uh, resource, but we know that um, it's, first of all, a non-renewable resource, uh, petroleum is, and uh, that also, uh, uh, processing it, acquiring it, uh, is, it can, can be harmful to the environment, it's harmful to the environment, right? So uh, the other thing about it is um, once we've made it, it's, it's kind of stuck as it is, right? I use this yogurt cup one time, right? Um, but it's going to remain a yogurt cup for a really, really, really long time, or it's going to remain this material for a really long time, right? Uh, things that are organic were once uh, or are currently alive can biodegrade. They can break down in the elements, right? They can just kind of um, become uh, the, the common materials, uh, uh, the common materials of life again, right? But if we have something plastic, it's going to kind of remain plastic, uh, for a long time. Even if it's broken down into tinier pieces, it's kind of in our environment and it, it's a source of a lot of pollution, right? So uh, what I want us to be thinking about today is uh, maybe plastic made of something else and is it possible? What do you guys think? Do you think that we could make plastic out of anything else? Well, we're going to be talking about how to make a form of plastic out of milk. Uh, and to kind of talk, uh, talk more about that, explain that, we're going to go back to what a plastic is. We know that it's made from oil, uh, from petroleum oil, typical plastics are. Um, and they're a type of material called a polymer. So a polymer is an arrangement of molecules, the little teeny, teeny, tiny things that make up everything. And they're a type of molecule that likes to link together. And they can be broken down using certain means uh, and rearranged in certain ways. So a lot of plastics, you can, uh, in many cases, heat them up and they'll be sort of a moldable, flexible uh, sort of uh, consistency. And then they can uh, be formed uh, more rigidly and they can be something like this cup, right? This is not a very plasticky cup, or rather a very liquidy cup. Um, because it was molded and then the, the uh, plastic became this rigid material. So we know that plastic has to be polymers and not all polymers have to be petroleum based. So we're going to be talking about how to get a polymer out of milk. Let's get to our milk. So I've got my milk right here in a carton. Um, I'm using skim. You guys can use whatever type of milk you want. I figured using skim uh, means that there's kind of uh, more of the material in it per volume. Uh, because if we have milk with fat in it, then the fat takes up more of the volume. Um, but I think it's, it's probably about the same um, if for our purposes. So we're going to need milk for our experiment. And I've got about a cup of it here. Um, there's something in the milk that we're going to take out. Um, and that's going to be our polymer to make our plastic. Do we know what that might be? What, what's in milk, first of all? I'm going to look at the ingredient list. It just says milk. <laughs> So the stuff inside of milk, we know that there are fats, there are sugars, there's dairy, exactly, it's a dairy product, right? Um, and there's also protein. If we look on our ingredients, or rather our uh, kind of nutritional information list right here, it says protein. This has eight grams of protein per serving. Protein is another example of a polymer, a natural 
polymer. Um, we can get it from many sources, including uh, plant-based, uh, plant -based, uh, animal-based. Uh, in this case, we are using um, uh, we are using an animal-based dairy uh, protein, and it's called casein. So we're going to get that casein, and I'm actually going to oh, actually we already said it here in the in the chat. That's great. So that casein protein is what we are going to extract and we're going to use as our polymer. Uh, to do that, we're going to have to do some things to the milk, right? We have our cup of milk here. You can use a little bit less or a little more if you want, but this is what I'm starting with, just a cup. And to begin to extract that casein from it, I'm going to start to heat it up. So I have my little microwave here. And I'm going to go ahead and heat it up for, um, you can do it gradually, but I'm just going to do it kind of all at once here because I've tested this before. Um, we're going to do it for a minute and 30 seconds. So I'm going to get that started. Whoops, I'm going to get that started. There we go. All right, so that's heating up. I'll tell you what else we're going to be using. Um, we've got that cup. I'm also going to be using a thermometer, a digital thermometer, to help me figure out the temperature because it works best at certain temperatures, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. I've got a bowl and a strainer in case I need to strain my materials once I've extracted them. I've got a spoon for stirring. And finally, I have got um, some acids. I've got some regular kind of household acids. One of them is vinegar and one of them is lemon juice. Um, if you guys are doing this along at home, uh, are, do you guys want to tell me which acid you're doing and I'll do whichever one you are? Are you using vinegar? Are you using lemon juice? Are you using something else? Just let me know, and that's the one I'll use. Um, we've got a question here about can we use almond milk? That's a really good question. There are so many uh, like plant-based milks. Um, for this one, we do have to use dairy because we're looking specifically at the casein. I know that there are some plant-based milks that still have protein in them. I'm not really sure of the specifics for extracting those proteins. Um, so for, for the purposes of this experiment, it does need to be dairy milk. All right, so we've got white vinegar, 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 lemon juice, vinegar. It sounds like most of us are using uh, vinegar, which is fine. I have used both. I used these when I was testing it yesterday. I used uh, lemon juice when I was testing it yesterday, but I will use vinegar for these purposes. Um, for a cup of milk, I'm going to need about four teaspoons. Four teaspoons of my acid, and we'll see if my uh, milk is at the right temperature for me to add it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch cameras. I'm going to switch to the experiment cam here. There we go. So as you can see, my milk is steaming a very little bit. I'm going to see if it's the right temperature. Uh, the temperature range we're looking for is about uh, 120 degrees Fahrenheit to 140 degrees Fahrenheit. That's kind of ideal. I'm going to see if I can find the temperature here. So I'm at about about 140, 144, um, about 150. So I'm going to let it cool for just a second. Um, it's probably OK if it's at about 150. But if it's much higher, that, uh, if, if it's much higher than 140, um, we don't get as good a yield, meaning we don't get as much uh, casein out as we might like. So I'm going to give it a little bit of a stir. That's a great way to get something to cool down. Another great way to get something to cool down substantially would be to pour it from one vessel into another. But since ours was only a little bit too hot, I think that that might work for us. So I'm getting my milk to the right temperature. I'm going to check it again. And this is saying about 130, 136, 140. That's about perfect. So I've got my milk at about, uh, about 140. It's not super hot. It's, it's just warm. It's steaming very slightly. And I'm going to go ahead and add my acid. Um, just like you guys are, most of us here, I'm going to use, um, I'm going to use four tablespoons per cup. That's our approximate ratio. You know, you can add a little bit more, but we want probably at least uh, uh, four tablespoons per one cup. I'm going to go ahead and add it here. Dump it here. That's two, three. I'm going to see if you guys can see what's happening on the cam. All right, there's my four tablespoons. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start, ooh, I want to see if you guys can see this. Maybe it's a little bit hard to see, but there's already some kind of uh, separation happening. I'm going to stir this up really well and give it just a minute to work. And if you're doing this at home, tell me what you might be noticing. 
or what you see on the cam. What do you see? Do you guys see that? Whoa, look at that separation. Wow. What is this stuff? It is kind of frothy. And, and look at this. What is that? <laughs> it's separating and, and maybe it has kind of a funny smell. Yeah, I, I personally am not a huge fan of the vinegar smell. That's not my favorite smell. Um, so it is a bit it is a bit strong for me. Um, it is sticking. Yeah, it's sticking. And look, it's kind of almost stretchy. I know um, some of us uh, may have uh, it's kind of less of something that's stretchy and more of just kind of small clumps uh, or curds. This is, in fact, the, the curds, whereas this is the whey, as in uh, Little Miss Muffet's favorite breakfast food, curds and whey. So that we have this separation happening. And what I'm going to do is uh, strain some of it out. Or actually, it's kind of stuck to my spoon. But we'll go through the motions of it just in case that's what you guys need to do. It is kind of like, it's like melted cheese. It looks kind of like that. It looks like slime. That's a great uh, observation. It does kind of look like that. Um, and, and that would probably be because a lot of types of slime, especially like uh, borax and glue, uh, that's another example of a polymer. And this is, in fact, a protein polymer, this casein. So I've kind of strained it out a little bit here. I didn't need to because mine was super goopy, but you might need to. Um, it's probably a cool enough temperature for us to touch now. I'm going to test it out. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. So I'm going to squeeze a little bit of my liquid out, um, especially if you're not a super big fan of that vinegar smell. You can always rinse it in some water. Kind of take the whole strainer and just dunk it in some water if you want to. Um, I'm going to go ahead and take this out so that we can see it. This is a really good question. Would cheese work? I don't know if we can uh, remove the casein from cheese. It's been kind of uh, subject to some different uh, conditions than just plain milk. That's a great question. Um, cheese is a little different in that it, of course, contains lots of this casein protein, but it also contains uh, plenty of the milk sugars and fats. Um, so here we go. I've got my pure casein ball, this casein protein, this polymer that I've extracted from my uh, cup of milk. And you can see it's a little bit stretchy. It's a little bit kind of rubbery, almost spongy. Um, and it's a little bit crumbly as well. Um, here's one that I made earlier, and I found that it was pretty crumbly as well. There's, um, there's actually one more step that I, that I discovered yesterday. I should say I discovered it for myself. I'm sure I'm not the first person to do so. Um, but I was kind of, I was taking it in my hand and I was kneading it to try to get a different, uh, like flatter shape. And I noticed that as it cooled, um, it's, it was a little bit harder to uh, get it into the shape that I wanted. So I thought, okay, I'm going to heat it up again. I'm just going to heat it up a tiny bit. I'm not going to put it in for another, you know, minute and 30 seconds or anything like that. But I am going to heat it up a tiny bit in my microwave and I'll show you guys what happened. I was actually really surprised. Um, because I had never seen this done before, and it's not included in our original curriculum list. I added it to the new curriculum list, which we'll, of course, uh, send to you guys. But here's what I'm going to do. I've got my bowl, and I've got my lump of casein in it, and I'm going to microwave it again. I'm going to microwave it for 20 seconds. So I'm going to go ahead and put that in there. All right, while that 20 seconds is going on, I might quickly switch my video here. There we go. So, um, and I'm not really sure, to be honest, which uh, uh, kind of setting my microwave is on. I didn't set it to, you know, full power or half power. It's just kind of. It's the time of program where my microphone shuts off. Sorry about that. <laughs> I was just saying that um, it's just on the setting that it that it comes on automatically. Um, I just kind of had tested it before and knew that with this particular model, uh, a minute and 30 seconds was what I needed to get the right temperature. So I have taken out my bowl. And you guys can see this. Oh, I'm actually going to go back to my experiment cam so that we can see. Um, if you are following along at home, this stuff is very, very hot. Look at this. Remember how it was a ball before? Now it is like this flat shape. I'm actually going to take my spoon because this is very hot. And I am going to scrape this off a little bit. Look at how kind of stretchy it is now. Whoa. 
So if yours is a little bit more clumpy um, or it doesn't form into a ball as well, uh, you can use this method. You can kind of heat it a second time for about 20 seconds in the microwave. Um, or you, you could do this on stovetop if you had a nonstick pan, because this is going to, I'm going to need to maybe soak my bowl a little bit uh, after this. I'm going to see if this is cooled down enough to touch. Yeah. So now mine has cooled down enough to touch. Oh, that's cool that, that yours looks a little bit more like this one. It, a lot of times the, uh, the temperature of the milk is what determines uh, what state we get afterward. But I found that no matter, what, uh, no matter what your state is when you first separate it, if it's clumpy, if it's more goopy, if it's more like dough or more like cheese, if you heat it the second time, you get this really amazing, stretchy, plastic-like polymer. So maybe it's not as stretchy. You'll have to experiment with it. I, um, I did a couple experiments where I microwaved this a number of times because when I found this out, I thought it was really cool. I had never seen this done before. When I uh, have done this experiment in the past, I had stopped when I got to this stage. So this time when I got something that was so, uh, so plasticky, I was really excited. Um, so I'm actually gonna heat this up again a second time because I'm going to roll it out really flat and kind of show you some of the things that you might be able to do with this. So I'm going to heat it up again. Um, I'm not very long, just about 10 seconds this time. And I'm going to get out a little bit of parchment paper because I want to try to roll mine out really flat with a rolling pin. This is a really good question. Is can you eat it? So um, we don't generally encourage <laughs> we don't generally encourage um, eating our experiments except for sourdough, of course, uh, because that's meant to be food. Um, this is, I guess, in a very technical sense, it is edible, but uh, putting a huge ball of protein in our stomach probably wouldn't uh, wouldn't be super great. Plus, uh, I know that I didn't wash my hands enough for food preparation uh, before I did this experiment. Um, if we leave it out to dry, then it, there's kind of a chance for for there to be uh, germs and stuff on it. Um, so it's, it's technically edible. It's more edible than, say, my plastic cup, but I would not recommend eating it. Generally good lab practice not to eat your experiments. Thank you, Max. So I've got my stretchy version again, and I'm going to roll it out really flat with a rolling pin. And I'll show you guys kind of what you get. The cool thing about it is if you don't really like uh, whatever shape you've made, you can always pop it into the microwave again and remelt it and reshape it. So I've got this nice uh, kind of flat shape here. Um, as it cools, it will become more rubbery, less moldable, um, and you can cut it into different shapes. Let me show you what I made. This is just a little, just a little heart that I made, um, and. I let this dry for, this was actually uh, only overnight. Uh, a lot of times you want to let it cure for at least 24 hours, but this one actually dried pretty fast. I just put it in the sun and it's really hard. As you can see, it's really smooth and it's actually really hard to, to bend, right? Because when we melted down uh, those, those proteins, uh, they kind of, when they melted down, they reformed and created a really, really strong structure. So we have a comment, R still looks like ricotta cheese. Do we need to keep microwaving? That might be a good plan. Go ahead and maybe give it a good stir and give it another microwave and see what happens. Um, I can always see, because this one is still cottage cheesy, I can always kind of do your experiment along with you and see what happens. Oh, maybe the type of milk did affect that. That's a really interesting question. Um, possibly it's that there is still some milk fat um, and, and some of the milk sugars attached to your curds. So you could give them another rinse uh, and see if that affects anything. The great thing about science is it's all data. That's one of my favorite things to say. Whether it works, quote unquote works, or doesn't work, it's always, it's always information. I know now, oh, maybe I don't do it that way, or maybe I know now, oh, okay, I do do it that way. I'm gonna give this about 20 seconds. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna see if that affects it. So here's something else that I, while this is microwave, that I want to show you guys. This is um, a really thin uh, bit of, uh, it had two heats, right? It, it was reheated that second time, so it turned into that nice, uh, really smooth plastic. And you can see it's thin enough that you can see uh, behind it. All right, here's what I got. All right, so this one did manage to melt. 
And we'll see what happens when I stir it up again, if it kind of turns into curds again, or if it will be nice and stretchy. But I liked this one because it reminded me of my plastic bag. So I'm kind of stirring it up a little bit. I'm noticing that this one um, has more liquid. So maybe it did have some more of those uh, kind of milk fats and milk sugars in them. Um, kind of in, in the minutes that we have um, before our lab will be over for the day, I wanted to, to turn this question over to you guys. Now, this is really cool that we can make plastic from milk. And um, I'll be honest with you, I'm not the first piece, person to think of this. I'll go ahead and uh, put this back to my face. Um, Milk plastic uh, was marketed as, it's called Galilith, and I'll put that in the chat so you can look it up. Galilith um, is made much the same way, uh, but it's also tempered with uh, formaldehyde, which long story short is kind of a, a chemical that I don't particularly want to be using in my home, so I'm not going to be able to do that part of, uh, of the process. But that's uh, how it was used and kind of made to be more like waterproof and more heat resistant. Uh, this stuff as it is, even though it is, um, when it is dried, it's nice and firm and uh, it's very smooth. It's not water resistant. If I plunk this in some water, it would probably begin to fall apart. Um, if I put this in the microwave, even after it has dried, it will turn into this again, right? So would I want to replace all the plastic in my house with milk plastic? What do you guys think? Would I, would I wanna do that if I, uh, if I wanted to, uh, have something in a cup and heat it up in the microwave? Would I want to have a glass made out of milk plastic? No, <laughs> no, that wouldn't work very well. There's lots of plastics that do lots of things. I'm thinking especially about medical plastics. That's something that we wouldn't want to make out of milk. Uh, I think someone in the chat also mentioned that they have even a case in allergy. You certainly wouldn't want to do that. Um, you certainly wouldn't want to use milk plastic for, uh, for medical devices if someone has an allergy, right? So there's other things about it too. Um, it's amazing that this is not only not made from petroleum, um, it, it also has the property of being biodegradable. So if I take this big lump and I toss it out my window and I give it, you know, maybe a few weeks, the rain hits it, the uh, animals get to it, um, rain gets to it, sun gets to it, all that stuff, uh, it will start to kind of break down just like we were talking about all organic things do. Of course, this is organic, so it will break down, which is pretty cool. Um, it's, it's not like if I throw this yogurt cup out my window, if I throw this out my window, um, first of all, I shouldn't do that. Second of all, it'll be there uh, weeks and weeks and weeks and even years and years and years later probably, right? So it's cool that milk plastic biodegrades. It is cool also uh, that it comes from a uh, kind of more of a renewable resource. But I would ask you guys to think about um, where milk comes from. Wait, this is, where, where do we get milk other than the grocery store? Where does it come from before that? It comes from cows, exactly, right? So not only do some people not eat animal products, right? That's one thing. Uh, the other thing is that raising a whole lot of cows to make a whole lot of milk also has effects on our environment, right? There can be a lot of um, runoff from fertilizer. Uh, there can be a lot of like methane production from cows, which is a gas that can contribute uh, to uh, climate change. Uh, so there's, there's, kind of, there's kind of no one perfect solution for uh, fixing all of the plastic problems we have uh, that we face in our world, right? We can't just replace everything with milk plastic. We also couldn't just replace it with starch or gelatin or corn plastic, right? Um, but it is kind of an interesting idea uh, and maybe it could be sort of a, what we would call a Band-Aid measure. Maybe it could offer some uh, harm reduction for, for the environment. Um, probably, right, as we work toward a more sustainable future together, uh, it's going to be a mix of things. You know, we want to make sure that uh, we are uh, reducing our use of plastic if we can. We want to make sure that we are recycling our plastic appropriately. And just maybe there are some other polymers out there that might offer us um, some interesting ideas. So um, that is all the time that we have for today's lab. I'm going to do kind of a quick closing. And then I see that I have uh, another, a few questions here in the chat. I'll address those if you can stay for a few extra minutes afterward. Um, but I wanted to, uh, of course, thank you guys all uh, for being here. If you want to share your experiment or have any more uh, ideas or questions, you can uh, post them on social media and tag the museum, the Museum of Life and Science, and hashtag lab at home. Because uh, we would love to see what you have. Um, we would love to see what 
you make and what you think. Um, we will send the curriculum for this week's Lab at Home via email at the end of the day today. Uh, and you can also watch the recording uh, of our live stream on the Museum of Life and Sciences YouTube channel a little bit later in the week. Um, I hope you guys will join us again next week. Uh, we have labs every Wednesday at 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. Uh, you can register on our Life and Science at Home page. Uh, I'll have Max put that in the chat here. You can also get that link through uh, member tips by email or by subscribing to the Life and Science at Home page. I hope you guys will join me next week uh, where we are going to be looking at acidity and using different household products like fruit juice and yellow highlighters to try and uh, see if we can figure out what household items are acidic versus alkaline. So thank you so much uh, everyone for being here. I'm gonna see if I can address this, uh, this uh, comment really quickly. Uh, we said someone who said, um, our experiment was a total fail. Failures are great. Failures are data. It's great to have that information. Uh, this person tried lemon juice and apple cider vinegar with skim milk, just two cups of bad smelling liquid. That's really interesting. Uh, and then uh, we have someone else who mentioned uh, that they had to fail with apple cider vinegar too. It might be the level of acid. I wonder if there's something else uh, in it that, that kind of prevents the, the formation of those curds. That's, that is really interesting. I would love to look that up and see, and see what that might be about. Um, do you know what the, if you're still here, do you know what the temperature of your milk was? Were you able to kind of pinpoint that or were you kind of guessing on that one? Because sometimes it has a lot to do with that. First attempted learning as kind of a, I don't think it's a euphemism. I think it is a true way to talk about failure. Exactly. I think it is uh, the best way that we learn, one of the best ways that we learn. So maybe it's a little bit hard to pinpoint that temperature. Um, I would say maybe see, uh, maybe do some uh, experiments on a smaller scale. Like instead of doing a full cup at a time, you can always try just doing maybe a quarter cup and then just doing one tablespoon of your acid um, and microwaving that maybe for different amounts of time and seeing which one works. Um, because if we can't pinpoint the temperature, we can at least pinpoint the time. That's something that we can, we can see on our microwave. Um, if you can, I would love to know what happens with that. I would love to know uh, what you guys end up finding. So please do, if you, if you would like, uh, post that on social media and tag the museum and lab at home because I'm really interested in seeing. Thank you guys uh, at all so much um, for doing these experiments with us, for having these really great questions and ideas, um, and thank you for sharing in the future. I'm going to go ahead and have uh, Max end our webinar here, but I look forward to seeing you all later. I hope I'll see you guys next week.